From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 188, recorded on September 25th, 2020. I'm Vincent Dracaniello, and joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Depomier. Hello there, Vincent. And from New York State, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Hello there, Daniel. <laughs> Everybody good? Yeah. I am doing well. Glad to hear that. Yeah, uh, You have what on your tie there, Daniel? Oh, so, um, you know, we're recording this on a Friday and, and a lot of my colleagues are aware that every Friday is STD day. Mm. Well, that looks like STI. Me, can, can I try to guess what it is? Because I can actually see it. Yeah. So this is sexually transmitted infection today. It's a protozoan. And, uh, and we're looking at uh, some flagellate that, you know, maybe some of the ladies have uh, sometimes dealt with in our audience. Trichomoniasis. Mm -hmm. Yes. TV. And as I like to point out to everyone, like I didn't make it. I didn't, you know, decide Friday was sexually transmitted infection day. It just is. And I merely <laughs> acknowledge that and celebrate it in my bow ties. <laughs> celebrate. It. Okay. It's a funny day to have. <laughs> it's a funny kind of celebration. I'd and say it's too. a funny thing to celebrate. Yeah. Oh, well. Exactly, so right. be it. Well, if you uh, like what we do, uh, you could. Support us at microbe.tv slash contribute, or you could uh, support Parasites Without Borders. They're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. On Facebook, Parasites Without Borders. Instagram, PWB underscore worldwide, and Twitter.com, capital PWB underscore global. There are links in the show notes if you want to do that. Okay. Yeah, I might need those. <laughs> They're in the show. Remember <laughs> and we promise to spell everything correctly when we post it. We'll yes, indeed. <laughs> oh, look at this. Someone deleted the Zoom link. That must have been Dixon, but that's okay. We're already here. In I the did Zoom. what? Never mind. <laughs> I didn't do anything. I touched nothing. <laughs> no worries. No worries, Dixon. All is good. All right. Look, so he, here we go. Oh, to here, did it. Someone he, did it. To here on TWIP. We start with our case from last week. Daniel, tell yes, us, remind us what was going yes. on. Yes. So for, as I like to say, everyone uh, tuning in for the first time and uh, our listeners tuning back in um, on TWIP 187, um, we discussed the case of a pregnant, newly married woman um, living on the North Shore of Long Island, what we refer to as the Gold Coast. Um this is the setting where uh, the great Gatsby um, gets its ideas and is placed. Uh, this uh, young lady is um, a daughter in an affluent family. She um, has just married a successful lawyer and the successful lawyer is very excited about uh, cooking. Um, she, she tries to eat very healthy. Um, she prides herself on um, being um, an organic eater. Uh, and uh, she has her her um, her baby um, baby boy, and the baby boy is born at nine months. And this woman is very into um, I'll say uh, natural things, so she doesn't have um, much monitoring or interventions during the pregnancy. Um, but when she does deliver the baby at home, um, she notices that the baby has an enlarged head. Um, at this point, she goes to see um, an OB. Um, obstetrician um, and the, uh, the, the young boy, uh, the newborn is diagnosed with hydrocephalus. Um, now the mother's healthy. She doesn't take any medication. She works in a retail store. She lives with the husband. Um, she uh, was not working for the second half of the pregnancy. Um, she had uh, only ingested alcohol rarely before and not at all during the pregnancy. Uh, there's no report of significant travel. Um, the patient reports having no pets herself, but her brother owns a small farm. Um, and as we learned, uh, the husband likes serving um, rare meats, all different sort of exotic rare meats. Um, this isn't something she would have eaten before she was married, but um, she does eat these um, since she married uh, this gentleman. Um, and uh, we're going to discuss um, 
an ultrasound, a CAT scan, and some blood work. Dixon, can you take that first one? Yes, I can. Um, Anthony writes, congenital toxoplasmosis. And he gives a link to uh, some information with regards to that. T. gonda infection, don't blame a cat, blame a cook. The parasite is present in raw meat. Thank you. That was a quickie. Daniel. <laughs> Daniel. Uh, Kay, Kay writes, uh, hi, thanks for all your hard work. Um, TWI blank are my weekly podcasting highlights. For this particular case, my suspicion would be Toxoplasma gondii infection. Toxo can be acquired from raw, rare, undercooked meats. However, I also suspect this might be a ruse. And the cause in this case could just be one of many congenital causes of hydrocephalus. One that comes to mind is arachnoid cysts. I'm not a parasite expert. I'm just a teacher, biologist, and pharmacist. But could you test for toxo before moving on to other causes? <laughs> Thanks again, Kay. David writes, hello, Twippers. Just a retired IT guy with an undergraduate biochemistry degree from about 40 years ago. It's still good who worked at a government public health organization for 38 years, discovering microbe TV after the COVID-19 pandemic began, has rekindled the biology and public health connections I've missed since leaving the day-to-day -day workforce. Thank you for the stimulating and informed discussions across TWIP, TWIV, and Immune. For the new case that Dr. Griffin describes in TWIP 187, a review of results from Google searches, for parasite-induced congenital hydrocephalus show many references to toxoplasmosis and cystocercosis. CDC and PubMed provide an overview of cystocercosis, which at first seemed like a possible contender. However, CDC site states, cystocercosis is only acquired from the fecal-oral root ingestion of eggs, not via the ingestion of cystocerci in undercooked pork. University of Chicago presents what seems to be a stronger case for toxoplasmosis. T. gondii is a parasite found throughout the world that has infected roughly 2 billion people. It can pass from mother infected for the first time to her unborn baby and causes several birth defects, including hydrocephalus, which causes a dangerous buildup of fluid in the brain. PDF of Parasitic Diseases 7th edition also seems to lend credence to toxodiagnosis. What a fascinating resource. <laughs> <laughs> Given the facts of the case, this is the first baby for the mother and her recent exposure to undercooked meats. I will submit a guess of Tiganda as the root cause of the hydrocephalus. As an aside, uh, CDC website on uh, cystocercosis is one of, the, one of the sources I looked at during my searching, and I noted the recommendation on that site to remove the skin from fruits and vegetables. What are your thoughts on this? And in particular, does this mean we should peel all our cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers, etc., from our home garden if eating them raw? Thoroughly washing them under running water has been the standard in our household, but perhaps more extreme measures should be taken. What does Dr. Racaniello do with the vegetables he harvests from his garden? Thank you for the stimulus. I eat them. <laughs> Thank you for the stimu <laughs> stimulating, good. entertaining, and enlightening scientific discussions you provide. The shows are a lighthouse of rational thought in the storm of chaos we are navigating through. Storm of chaos. Love it. Uh, I wash my vegetables. I... The cucumbers, sometimes I peel, sometimes I don't. Depends on what I'm looking for in a dish, right? Tomatoes, I don't right. peel. Right. Peppers, I don't peel. I just wash them. Right. Um, what What do you guys think? No, I, that's what I do. <laughs> I, I think what I think he must listen to Twiv or that episode where you know you wandered into the world of what was it Twig this yeah. week in gardening, yeah. and everyone shared all their gardening tips. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I guess we'll have to talk about this. this is a good thing. What, what do you think, Dixon? Does Do people have to worry about getting um, parasitic diseases from eating uh, fruits and vegetables that they grow in their gardens here in the United States? What, what do you think? Well, um, it depends. It's not a, a, the answer is yes and no. It depends on where you are. I mean, really, the, one of the biggest outbreaks I can think of that uh, had that as its source was an outbreak of listeriosis, uh, which actually killed 13 people uh, because the grower forgot to, uh, didn't forget, they neglected to wash the outside of their cantaloupes before they sold them. And as a result, people who sat down for breakfast and sliced through this cantaloupe without washing it 
assuming it was washed because everything you get in the grocery store is supposed to at least be washed a little bit. Um, they got sick and died. I mean, this was a horrible outcome. And uh, the Jensen Farm, which was in Colorado, you might have known about them because that's where you did some work at one time, uh, were slapped on the wrist and told not to do that again, but they were never punished for it, which I thought was a horrible oversight on the part of the the justice mm. system. But I can't, th- well, I, well, we'll get to this. I, I have never heard of where we're going with this story um, being transmitted through uh, eating raw or undercooked vegetables. Um, but I have heard about, well, we're, we don't want to spoil the ending, but let, let me yeah. just read, <laughs> Kate, let me read Katie's letter first, get through the email, and then we'll come back to these uh, very interesting questions as to what you should do. Katie writes, good evening. My guess is Toxoplasma Gandhi. She probably got it from the uncooked meat her husband cooked for her. Mm-hmm. I just learned that the organism can remain infectious in meat for very long periods of time, refrigerated or even frozen. But the simple act of cooking will prevent infection. Yes. Fortunately, she could have been tested and the child treated had she gone for prenatal checkups. And this is true. They used to do a test called torch test. Do they still do that, Daniel? So they do. They do. Okay, so she she didn't do that, and it's too bad because they may have picked it up, um, although they may not have. I mean, I think that depends on when she catches it as to when they do that test. Yeah, I should I should um, you know what is the torch test? So the torch profile is usually something we do when a baby is born, and it's a screen right. you're looking for. We'll go through the letters. So um, toxoplasmosis, that's the T O, um, rubella, that's the R, cytomegalovirus, that's the the C, yep. um, herpes and HIV are the H, sort of doubled up to H these days. Uh-huh. But, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure that that would have been, um, you know, the, the torch screen, as you mentioned, that that, but um, potentially someone might have done an ultrasound, right, during the pregnancy, yep. you noticed That's something right. early. So, yeah. That's right. That's right. Good, good point. I'm a vegetarian, but also a crazy cat lady. Do those cancel each other out? <laughs> I've read that latent T. Gandhi infection can lead to behavioral changes in the host. So being a crazy cat lady really is a thing. Speaking of cats and parasites, I once got ringworm from a stray cat, and it was extremely hard to get rid of. There is currently a neighbor's cat that likes to visit me on my porch, but I put a glove on before petting him. My own children are not allowed outside. Thanks again for intellectual stimulation and entertainment, Katie from Missouri. P.S. Should I read this too? Um, <laughs> 71 Fahrenheit, 89% humidity, and 93.5 days SARS-CoV-2 case count average with a 44% positivity rate here in Boone County. Wow. That's really, really high. Wow. wow. That is lethally high. That is, wow. No wonder your kids stay inside. I don't blame you. Wow. Daniel, do you yeah. think that uh, Toxo causes behavioral changes in the host, in the human host? Uh, oh, my, you're, you're really going down a, uh, a hole okay. here. All right. Um, so, <laughs> so should our case today be toxoplasmosis? Right. So should it come out to be that? Yeah, we don't come know. out to be that. <laughs> um, there, there is um, data suggesting that it has behavioral impacts on, on mice, on yeah. rodents. Yeah. Um, and though there's been a tremendous amount of research looking at potential behavioral impacts on humans, um, none of that's really been conclusive. So there's, there's, you yeah, know, that's right. Okay. We had an expert on one of our shows yeah. early on, uh, uh, John Boothroyd mm-hmm. from Stanford, and he was unconvinced yeah. that uh, human behavior was affected by this infection. With, with being so so frequent an infection, you'd expect some abnormalities to eventually come out because of that. But well, what it does in mice, by the way, is to dull their sense of smell. Yeah. And as a result, they don't smell the cat urine. And as a result of that, of course, they become a victim. Dixon, uh, that's uh, the behavioral change that they're looking at. Could be. So uh, I don't think that if we could smell cat urine or not, it wouldn't matter worth a. Yeah. Dixon, I mean, yeah. <laughs> and, and again, like, should this be toxo? Um, 
the, <laughs> um, you know, as, as early, early was put on, you know, blame, blame the, blame the meat, not the cat. If you look at areas of the world where there's tremendously high levels of um, infection with toxoplasmosis, like Brazil, like France, um, yeah, it's associated right. with the that's ingestion right. of undercooked meat. It's not as though you go to Brazil or um, Paris and find the streets just, you know, overrun with canines. But a cat litter box is a risk factor. They tell you not to do that when you're yeah, pregnant, true. right? That is true. That is true. Because if it's a house cat and you say, well, how the heck is a house cat going to catch this infection if there are no mice in my house? Mm -hmm. The answer is they can catch it from actually being fed little portions of raw hamburger or other meats that uh, is common during the preparation of food. And anyone with a cat knows very well that the cat will jump up on the table while you're preparing the food because, of course, they smell the food and uh, they want to be fed. So occasionally they give a little tidbit. And that's a very common source for should this be toxoplasma? <laughs> yeah. And, that, and the interesting thing there, right, is there's this incubation period where, you know, it, it's not like you get it directly from the cat feces. So right. um, it has to actually embryonate in the, in right. the litter box for a That's period right. of time. Right. Um, you know, and you think, oh, I'm going to change the litter box every single day. Well, you, you may not get everything and that that's what leads to the problem. But. They now have litter boxes that have automatic scoopers. <laughs> I've seen yeah. them. They're motor driven scoopers that clean them every single day. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Daniel. Ale Alexander writes, dear twip trifecta here in Vienna, Austria. Uh -huh. 20 C 68 F and very windy with a thunderstorm just waiting to hit us in the afternoon. Uh -huh. When I first wrote to you a few months ago, I thought that I could pick up a habit and uh, participate in this podcast regularly. Alas, the phase two trial for severe COVID I'm working on is taking up so much time and effort <laughs> that I simply <laughs> forgot. Thankfully, an end to this tedious work is on the horizon, and I'm looking forward to having our results torn apart on TWIV a few months from now. <laughs> However, on to the case. Right. Of course, most cases of congenital hydrocephalus are not caused by parasitic diseases. Rather, aqueductal stenosis, intraparenchymal cysts, meningitis, intracranial hemorrhage, Arnold Chiari malformation, Daniel wow. Walker syndrome and many other genetic syndromes can cause hydrocephalus and should first be considered depending on the clinical scenario and history. However, this is a podcast about parasites. In this case, the kind that make you sick. <laughs> One of the most common parasitic diseases that can lead to um, fetal morbidity if acquired during pregnancy is, of course, toxoplasmosis caused by T. gondii which is named after an exceptionally cute North African rodent called Gundi, in which the parasite was first described in 1908. While most people think of toxoplasmosis as a disease spread by cats, if they are not properly autoclaved, uh, consuming the undercooked meat of any animal infected with T. gondii can spread the infection since the cysts are frequently found in muscle tissue. Commonly symptoms, common symptoms of congenital toxoplasmosis include hydrocephalus, retinochoroiditis, meningoencephalitis, which often result in sensorial neuronal hearing loss, reduced intelligence, and epileptic disorders in the affected infant. Due to the high prevalence of T. gondii oocysts, in the soil, some developed countries have screening programs during prenatal doctor's visits, which our patient might have neglected in favor of a gestational strategy she might have considered to be more natural. Since congenital infection is much more likely if the woman is infected for the first time during pregnancy and she has only recently started snacking on exotic meats, the risk is obvious. A differential to consider would be meningoencephalitis due to infection with Bailey Ascaris procyonis, which is exceedingly rare roundworm found primarily in raccoons. It's known to cause encephalitic meningoencephalitis, which might also explain hydrocephalus. But I haven't managed to find any reports on congenital cerebral larva migrants due to B. procyonis. There are none. I believe this is a classic case of congenital toxoplasmosis. The kid likely needs some imaging, an eye exam, maybe a surgical intervention with or without the implantation of a permanent shunt and pharmacological therapy with pyrimethamine, sulfadiazine, and leucovorin for one year. 
Thank you for your excellent podcast and the high quality banter. All the best and stay safe, Alexander. Nice. Yeah. Maggie writes, dear doctors, longtime listener, first time guesser. My guess for the hydrocephalic baby is that its mother is unknowingly serving as an intermediate host for Tigandai. Likely she consumed contaminated food or drink, maybe undercooked meat with oasis from a barn cat's feces and the cross through the placenta to infect the developing fetus within the first couple of trimesters. As far as I know, there would be no transplacental transmission if the mother had eaten tissue cysts and undercooked meat. So must have unwittingly been exposed to infected cat feces. Washing hands, a recent theme that should be continued into the future. And washing the meat that will be served rare would make this much less likely. I'm sorry to hear about this story and wish the family luck in raising their child. Thank you all for that uh, you do to share firsthand stories of medicine and science with us all. Keep twipping Maggie from Utah. Hmm. 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 Uh, Josh writes, hello, twip hosts. It is a balmy 70F, 21C in Baltimore, Maryland. I think the neonate with hydrocephalus in TWIP 187 may be suffering from a toxoplasma Gandhi infection required congenitally, potentially through the contaminated rare meats in the home. Ultrasound is likely to reveal evidence of elevated ICP in the child. CT, with contrast, may show ring-enhancing lesions in the brain of the child and or mother, Testing peripheral blood of both the child and the mother for toxoplasma IgG, toxoplasma-specific IgM, will likely reveal a positive IgG and IgM in the mother and an IgG in the child. If serologic testing is negative, PCR of the CSF should be performed when there is strong clinical suspicion for toxoplasma infection. I'm a medical student at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and love your podcast. I'm currently doing an elective in clinical microbiology lab led by Dr. Karen Carroll of Manual of Clinical Microbiology fame. And your podcasts are constantly providing me with interesting tidbits to share with the rest of the microbiology staff here who love hearing all about all of the interesting parasite stories shared by you in each week. Thanks for all you're doing to promote the awesome science of microbes. Josh, that's a nice letter. Daniel, I think you're next, right? All right. Yes. Catherine. Yes. <laughs> Catherine writes, hi all. Regarding the sad case of the lady from Long Island with a child born with hydrocephalus, my guess is that she became infected with Toxoplasma gondii during her pregnancy, which resulted in hydrocephalus in her fetus. This is guess is based on a quick consult with my web browser. I entered parasites <laughs> and hydrocephalus in neonates and toxoplasmosis showed up. Um, the description of common sources of T. gondii included cat feces, which fit with the possibility of feral cats roaming on the mother's farm, and eating undercooked meat, which fit with the mother's ingestion of very rare meat. Also noted that blood work is used to diagnose toxoplasmosis, and that Dixon seemed to know the answer before Daniel um, described <laughs> the testing. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm new to TWIP, but the episode was so interesting, it overcame my usual repulsion to anything parasitic. Live and learn, <laughs> Catherine, Victoria, Victoria, British Columbia. Nice. Akar writes, hello, TWIP from a cloudy Stockholm. Hope this finds you well and healthy. I'll try to stay short and to the point as time always seems to be in short supply, which makes your podcast empire productivity even more impressive. I do love the work you do in the community. It makes me feel I belong to. To the point, if other structural or obstructive reasons for congenital hydrocephalus have been excluded, I'd consider infectious causes. And if no other neurological deficits are present, the other torch infections sound unlikely. Most likely culprit seems to be toxoplasmosis. Osis from undercooked meat is likely the advent of that risk factor also coincides with her pregnancy. I find it odd though in Sweden, there's a strict and generally well-known dietary guideline for pregnant women. X, avoid raw undercooked meat, unpasteurized products, some fish such as lake fish, parasites, Baltic fish, and high tier apex predators, accumulation of heavy <laughs> metals, environmental toxins, and so on. And a routine ultrasound is nearly always performed around gestation week 19. What are the recommendations in the US? Anywho, amniotic PCR is a bit post festum, serological mm -hmm. diagnosis a bit difficult due to transferred IgG from the mother. IgA, IgM could be useful. PCR of blood and CSF gives diagnosis as well as serology. Mainly IgM barrier damage, high protein permits serum IgG leakage. 
CSF eosinophilia together with markedly elevated protein levels can be seen. Hopefully I'll have time for a Kevin-esque letter sometime <laughs> in the far post-pandemic future with regardless and endless admiration, a KID physician. <laughs> Kevin-esque. Nice. That's cool. Tim writes, TWIP, the rare meat vector is suggestive of Toxoplasma gondii infection, as is Dixon's smirk when this vector is presented. I wish I could expand as many of your listeners do, but I can't. My backstory is doesn't fit this podcast, to say the least. I searched the web, downloaded a seventh edition textbook of parasitic diseases. This seems to fit the bill. Toxoplasmosis, likely due to the relatively new diet and novel culinary technique, though this can happen to anyone and is common. I'm interested in these cases, but researching and thinking about the people here, I wish for a gentler diagnosis. Please help me with that. I will gladly sacrifice my textbook lottery for a happier outcome for this child and family. Tim, that's a nice last thought. Yeah. James writes, I teach neuropath and microbiology, causes of neonatal hydrocephalus, hemorrhage into ventricles, subarachnoid trauma hypoxia, genetic conditions, spina bifida, neural tube defects, and drumroll infections, toxoplasmosis, syphilis seem like leading contenders. Toxo is almost the perfect parasite. It can infect many animals. We normally think of cat poo as the infectious source, but lots of animal meat from seafood to birds to mammals can bring toxo cysts in the muscle. So I think it's toxo. We usually think of the disastrous brain eating that happens in the first trimester along with the torch group. Toxo, other slash syphilis here he puts, rubella, CMV, herpes, and we're going to add HIV for you. Um, by the way, there's an entertaining sci-fi book called Parasite Yes. By, by Mira Grant, <laughs> in which uh, scientists commingle diphilobotrium, toxoplasma, and a bunch of therapeutic genes to give people to cure them from various ailments. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> of course, it does. Thanks for all you do. Taking any twips in the near future. That's funny. <laughs> no, not me. I don't, I don't know. Have you guys have you guys ever read the book by uh, Mira Grant? I, have not. I thought we were familiar with it. No, uh, Vincent, didn't we uh, have one book by somebody that had that as the title of their book? And I thought we were amazed that someone should write it, but. Uh, no, I don't so, know this particular parasite book by Mira. So, uh, so Mira is actually that's her one of her writing names. Um, I actually know this woman. We've we've emailed. She has a copy Look of our at you. book. Look at you. Um, so, <laughs> Seenan Seenan McGuire. I don't know if she listens to us on a regular basis, but I'm a fan of hers. I I, I found this book fascinating. Um, oh, great! And then there are sequels. There's sequels, and she writes on other topics. <laughs> <laughs> And she's, she's got our book, so she at least gets the parasitology right. Well, yeah, I thought that one. You know, once I read the first book, I thought, you know, seen and here's here's a here's a copy, so you can read all about it and then write even more sequels. <laughs> I think uh, I'm not taking any twips, but Dixon, you might, right? Maybe. You're going to drive out west, right? I was, but you know, I, I I I've lost my enthusiasm for it. It's gotten late in the year, and um, I see. I think we're going to postpone until next summer. Daniel, you're not taking any twips, right? Twips, no, just trips. local, <laughs> just staying local. Because <laughs> right. yeah, because you you typically do travel a lot, and uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's I've missed a lot of I've really missed a lot of trips. Um, you know, so I, I missed, you know, I, I should be getting ready to hop on a plane to Uganda. Um, right, I right. missed, um, you know, a couple trips down to Panama. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. I think that instead of going to Glasgow, we're going to do like a remote um, series of lectures. So, yeah, this is, uh, I missed my Amsterdam trip. Yeah, I've missed a lot of travel. Oh. Mm. Yeah, it's tough. All right. Uh, Barry writes. Dear. Greetings from Baltimore, where it's another hot day and this what feels like the 97th of March. I've been subscribing to TWIP for a few months now, have thoroughly enjoyed working my way through the back catalog. Who knew an experimental psychologist working for the U.S. military would find parasitism so fascinating? <laughs> I look forward to each episode, and though I have 
effectively no formal education in biology or medicine. I always try to reason my way through Dr. Griffin's case studies. I'm going to throw my hat into the proverbial parasitic ring this week with a guess as to the case of the woman with the hydrocephalic infant. I believe her child's misfortune is a case of congenital toxoplasmosis, result of in utero infection by T. gondi, an amoebic parasite whose definitive host is the cat. Dr. De Pommier often refers to T. gondi as the world's most successful mammalian parasite due to its ability to infect any cell and its, this ability to infect macrophages in particular and the unfortunate timing of the initial infection of the woman likely during the first trimester that led to the child's pathology. According to PD7, T. gondi is transmitted by injection of one of two phases of the parasite's life cycle, one oocyst from cat feces, from drinking contaminated water, or from eating food handled by someone who is exposed externally, as in the oft-warned against practice of cleaning the cat box, and didn't practice good hygiene practices prior to food preparation, or two more often in omnivores and predators, pseudocysts lurking in raw or undercooked meat. Pseudocysts are found throughout the tissues of infected organisms and represent a more or less stable chronic state of infection held in check by a number of immune responses too complicated for my social scientist brain to understand in any detail. <laughs> Dr. Griffin mentioned two potential sources of the microbe, though his tone and repeated mention of one lends me to believe it to be more probable. The less likely comes from the woman mentioning that her brother's family has a farm and has been noted a number of times in TWIP. Farms often have a resident barn cat or two. Could be that her direct exposure to cat feces was from working in the barn or eating food prepared by someone else working there, with the infection likely through whatever activity one does when working in a barn. Did I mention being a city boy as well? Enough said. <laughs> the more likely cause, though, was the hint that the woman's husband enjoyed gourmet cooking, including preparing various meats, I suspect, undercooked meat, fresh from the butcher, never frozen, which could have killed the parasite and prepared rare or even in the French manner of bleu. See footnote. Bleu. That's bleu. bleu. <laughs> as the source of the pseudocyst, it was the especially poor timing of the woman's initial infection during pregnancy that led to the parasite hitching a ride within a macrophage and after crossing the placental barrier, infecting the developing fetal CNS. If I'm lucky enough to be chosen for the book, please draw another number as I already purchased a copy from Amazon. I personally don't get much from control effing through a PDF when I don't know the material well. <laughs> Besides the book's placement on my coffee table next to birds of the Chesapeake Bay garners lots of comments and quizzical looks. Nice. Birds of Chesapeake Bay. Thanks yeah. again for the podcast, and especially thanks to Dr. Griffin, Parasites Without Borders, and groups like Floating Doctors. I made my donation today for reminding us all Good that parasites you. aren't just a nuisance on a camping trip or cookout. Sure, yeah. Note, blue is also the French word for blue, and it, for a steak it means very, very rare, leaking onto the plate when cut. When you feel the need for an almost raw steak, and a steak bleu will be filled that need. A steak bleu indicates that the chef will have allowed the steak to take a quick peek at the grill or frying pan in passing. <laughs> On its way to your plate, a steak bleu is just sealed on the outside. When cut, that steak will leak copiously onto your plate. It will have been cooked maybe for one or two minutes on each side. It does not sound appealing at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's myoglobin. It's not blood. It's myoglobin, I tell you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's true. Dick, Dick, Martha Dick. writes, Dear Twip, this is my first time responding to your quiz. I'm just a retired OB. The detail that jumped out at me was taking a newborn to an OB. I hope that when the folks called to make an appointment with the OB, that the OB directed them to a neonatologist. I'll guess that the cause of the hydrocephalus was Toxoplasma gondii. The mother had not been infected prior to pregnancy, acquired the infection in pregnancy, and this passed the placenta to the fetus. I think the treatment would be a shunt. I enjoy all your podcasts. They help pass the time while physically distancing in the pandemic. Best wishes to you all. I actually like this. I thought that that was a good comment. And um, it's interesting, like when we decide who are the primary care docs in the world um, right. for this mother, I mean, you know, you, she didn't have a relationship. And so, you know, that was sort of her thought of who would be the person in the medical system to go to. And so we'll, we'll get more into sort of the story later on, but 
Uh, yeah, you can imagine an obstetrician, what do they do? They take care of pregnant women, they deliver babies. That's you know, right. you, you show them a, a baby with problems. That's not exactly what their uh, forte is all about. So. Yeah, you're right on that one. Hey, um, Daniel, you are next. Anthony writes, the case presented here is the usual textbook case of toxoplasma that those interested in infectious disease usually learn. Um, and sadly, these types of cases appear to be somewhat common. I really think there needs to be a public campaign to tell people about eating undercooked lamb during pregnancy, since if you were to ask people on the street what meat should not be eaten undercooked, I'd bet that 95% would say chicken and pork and not be aware of the pregnancy risk associated with lamb. The diagnosis, I believe, is done by detecting IgG antibodies to the protist or detecting protist DNA in the blood via lamp or RT-PCR. A few episodes ago, Dixon wanted to know more about the home PCR kit me and a colleague have been working or been using, so I should provide a short article written by my colleague and gives us a link here. Maybe Vincent could also share this with Elio since he is one of, one of us mushroom people. Okay, Deborah writes, Dear Twippers, Writing from Pittsburgh, PA, where it is delightfully chilly 55F in the early morning. I love listening to the podcast while I work the overnight shift as a lab tech. I usually miss sending in my guesses by just a few days, but not this time. I believe this new mother and her son have toxo. A cursory Google search tells that Tigande is a common parasitic cause of infant hydrocephaly due to congenital toxo. If the mother eats rare meats, often it's quite possible she would become infected with no noticeable symptoms. If she was infected very early in pregnancy, she might not have been aware of her condition and still been eating her husband's rare carnivorous diet. I assume the blood tests are to detect antibodies against the parasite and the CT to detect any cysts. This all said, I'm writing during my short break at work and I may have fully overlooked the clue to lead me away from this obvious guess. Thanks for the hours of entertainment, Deborah. Dixon, you're muted. Sorry about that. Uh, Carol writes, greetings from upstate New York. I am now addicted to this podcast, LOL. I have also been listening to it and enjoying TWIV to get the latest on SARS-CoV-2. Daniel's voice is so soothing to listen to. I, I concur with that. I also enjoy the friendly banter between everyone, and my husband can hardly believe that I'm listening to a science podcast. Here is my answer to case number 187. First time pregnancy, immunocompromised host, plus raw meats, organic or not, plus hydrocephalus in newborns equals congenital toxoplasmosis. Why did this happen in the U.S.? It appears that there is no protocol for testing American pregnant women for toxoplasma antibodies as compared to European pregnant women who are tested for prior exposure to the parasite. Raw meats, especially ground hamburgers or steak tartare, are known for harboring the organism. Damn that juicy rare burger at the picnic. I have heard that much more steak tartare is eaten in Europe, so possibly the reason for the testing protocol for pregnancy there. It appears that mom had never had an exposure to toxoplasma resulting in zero antibodies to protect her fetus when she ingested the tissue cysts in the raw meat, resulting in a more severe situation in the fetus. The fetus becomes infected when the organism crosses the placenta and disaster results. I hope I'm right about this one. Thanks for always providing an interesting case. Until next time, Carol. Cool. All right, Kevin writes, long time lurker, first time guesser. <laughs> Just the patient in TWIP 187 and her baby are dealing with Toxoplasma gondii, most likely acquired through the undercooked meats. Treatment, ask your health practitioner. I'm in IT. <laughs> My recommendation would be, have you tried turning it off and on again? <laughs> Don't do that with children. Um, in the other parasite news, I ran across this archaeological study of parasite burden, which suggests that the rate of infection remains steady until societal changes in hygiene, plumbing, and sanitation were more widespread in European countries. And there's a link. Thanks for the always informative and delightful podcast. Kevin from Minneapolis, Minnesota. <laughs> Turning it on and off. I often do that here with all my recording equipment when it doesn't work. 
Sean writes, hi, TWIP team. I've been enjoying the entire Microbe TV ecosystem since first discovering the podcast in January. I have been thrilled and amazed with the rapidly and ever-increasing production quality since that time, and to finally put faces to the voices, your views and perspectives have been the horse to which I've hitched my cart these last months. I am just a physician assistant and live in Virginia where it is 71F today and actually feels like 71F for once. We have finally gotten a reprieve from real field temps that were in the triple digits much of the summer. Began listening to TWIV partly for professional regions, reasons, more on that another time, and I love it. In response to a previous letter you read, read on TWIV, the episodes are indeed long but not onerous. The episodes occupy my workouts and commute all week long. You keep me informed, encourage me to think critically and help me speak knowledgeably to others in my official capacity where I direct healthcare policy. I sincerely enjoy and appreciate Dr. Griffin's clinical updates on TWIV and these parasitology case studies are really enjoyable. They help me flex parts of my brain I have not used much since my tropical medicine course years ago. As a PA, I sometimes wish I could claim the hours I spent weekly as Category 1 CME. It is the Cat 2, at least, journal reading and such, but the time is just so enjoyable and the banter makes us feel like part of the group. As far uh, as for the case for neonatal hydrocephaly in the affluent, organically-minded mother whose husband entertains dinner guests with tartar, I think we have a great setup for congenital toxogondi. Typically, this is a reason that we encourage mothers not to interact with or clean a litter box, at least during pregnancy. Tigandai is also transmitted via consumption of undercooked meat and unwashed natural produce, of which the mother has a good history of exposure. The outcome of the child can be variable and is somewhat related to when the disease was contracted, but can certainly lead to visual problems and learning disabilities, if not more. Thank you for sharing this interesting, albeit sad case. Can't wait to, wait to hear how things are going once Dr. Griffin gives the answer, Sean. Kevin writes, hello, heroes of TWIP. Case guest for TWIP 187. I finally caught up to all of the TWIP and immune. Time for my first case guess, and it sounds like an easy one. Congenital toxoplasmosis explains the hydrocephalus in the baby and fits the history of the mother. If she had not eaten much meat prior to the marriage, she was unlikely to have acquired Tigandai until the time of her pregnancy, when she encountered this master parasite in some undercooked meat. Treatment is paramethamine, sulfadiazine, and leucovorin for the baby. The prognosis is sadly usually severe, although the birth was not premature and a few other signs were mentioned, so I'm hoping the baby can still have a good quality of life. I leave a discussion of various non-parasitic possibilities or less likely involvement in tania solium to my capable colleagues. I have been dreaming of volunteering with Peace Corps for years. I've always, I always get excited when Dr. Griffin gives case studies from abroad or involving Peace Corps. And I think, ooh, I might get to see that, or ooh, I might get that. <laughs> In addition to parasites, I'm fascinated by organ donation and I have researched living donor kidney donation. For the most part, living kidney donation is safe. However, with running around underdeveloped countries with a single lonely bean be a bad idea? I know this isn't a parasite question, or is it? And then I can talk to my living donor evaluation team on PC recruiters about it, but I first thought to ask Dr. Griffin. Feel free to leave the question off the podcast if you're relevant. In honor of my harm, homonymous, 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 no, homonymous, homonymous, yeah, okay. The fellow, <laughs> but, <laughs> well, I'll, I, you know, I get to see these for the first time. I can practice this at home, you know. Um, uh, fellow Twipster, I often, I offer an ending oddity. The Talmud states that the heart understands, the spleen laughs, the kidney brings anger, the stomach brings sleep, and the kidneys advise. Specifically, the right kidney advises good, while the left kidney advises evil. Better than to donate your left kidney, I guess. Shalom Bashana Tova. Happy New Year, Kevin H. Okay. Shalom Bashana Tova. Yeah, so Tova right now, Tova. so right now, while we're recording this, we are in the period of the 10 days of atonement. Ah. From the uh from the new year um to the um 
the day of atonement. Um, and my dad, my dad always, um, always comments. He's not sure why you need 10 days because he never has anything to atone for. (laughs) 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 And by the way, you Catholics, what are you doing in those confessionals every week? (laughs) That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. (laughs) So, <laughs> All right, Peter writes in TWIP 187, Dr. Griffin reported the case of a newborn with hydrocephalus. A search in Parasitic Diseases, 7th edition, <clears throat> shows that hydrocephalus is associated with both T. solium infection in some forms of neurocystosarcosis and also in toxoplasmosis, mm. Mashita et al. However, report that hydrocephalus is more commonly found in adults with cystosarcosis, not in neonates. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, hydrocephalus is also a symptom of congenital toxoplasmosis. Congenital toxoplasmosis is caused by lesions in the central nervous system, which in turn are caused by the AP complexin toxoplasma gondii. Infection is more common during the later stages of pregnancy, but clinical symptoms are more common in infections early in pregnancy. The adult mother could have been infected with some of the rare meats her husband likes cook, likes serving as the oocysts of this parasite are often ingested in undercooked meat. Prompt treatment of the disease with antibiotics such as methamine and sulfadiazine and, and hydrocephalus through the placement of a shunt to drain fluid could lead to good outcomes and prevent problems later in the child's life. The husband should be urged to cook his meat more thoroughly. Peter, P.S. writing from a cloudy Cape Town and P.P.S. Please give the Ebola outbreak in Ecuador Province DRC a mention on TWIF. Um, There have been 124 cases, 50 deaths, the 10th worst outbreak of the disease. Um, So, you know, healthcare workers are fighting this in very difficult um, circumstances. And yeah, I'm adding this part here. Um, you know, my wife was actually, we were talking about vaccines and, you know, here's this um, vaccine for Ebola, which now exists and is very exciting and yet not much press because all the press is focused on other things. Hmm. Are they using it there in that outbreak, Daniel, the vaccine? So I do not know. I do not know. Hmm. Andrew writes, Kia Ora from Pongaroa, book I have not one yet, but I can see my future copy in some of the videos. <laughs> <laughs> Vincent can see. Vincent has two stacks of them behind him in some videoed podcasts. Uh, mine this is, is, the, is, is the one second from the bottom in the stack at the rear. <laughs> okay. Yeah, these are all unsigned. You're right. And I have to wait for these guys to come in and sign them. Uh, weather, spring has arrived and we have a windy day with a temperature of 18 C. A mild La Nina, just called by NOAA, will mean a warm and wet spring oh and summer for us. COVID-19, it's the secondary effects are the most intriguing here. Health officials are racing to make sure MMR vaccinations that were missed during the lockdowns are administered. We have had almost no flu season here. It will be interesting to see if there's an increase in non-SARS-CoV-2 infections as normal life returns or not. Should we beat the odds and remain relatively free from viral respiratory diseases, we will be in for a, will we be in for a deluge when the borders open again? Case of the baby with hydrocephalus. I love the video version of the podcast. Dixon's wry mute chuckle at 113 in the video is the most telling clue. It coincides with (laughs) Daniel relaying the woman's husband's love for rare meats. (laughs) A quick look in PD7, and I checked for parasites that can cause hydrocephaly and came up with T. solium, the pork tapeworm, and T. gondii. T. solium does not seem to readily pass through the placenta, but T. gondii sure can. To quote PD7, page 133, in 1923, Yosef Yanku described the congenital manifestations of the infection, which he accurately characterized as causing hydrocephalus and chorioretinitis. So my guess is toxoplasmosis. Namehi Andrew. Hmm. All right, Dixon, you are muted again. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I, you know, I do this to prevent uh, Vincent from having to pull his hair out and editing all my coughs. So Elsie writes, dear Twip Prefecto. Elise. I'm Elise. Okay, I'll start again. <laughs> Elise writes, trifecta, the sky is bright blue and it is 64 degrees Fahrenheit, 17.7 centigrade in lower Manhattan. 
though it feels as if the world is on fire. Thank you so much for providing a well of intelligence, compassion, and interest in a moment where I feel thirsty for anything that doesn't make me angry or despairing. I do believe I have a diagnosis for the mother and baby in the case described in TWIP 187. I believe the mother has toxoplasmosis and the baby's hydrocephalus is also the result of the infection. Toxoplasma gondii is a common parasite found all over the world and it is frequently found in cat feces and in raw meat. Adults are infected, frequently have no symptoms at all, and infection is mostly a problem when people have compromised immune systems. Pregnant women and the fetuses are much more vulnerable, vulnerable to infection. I believe I heard somewhere that pregnant women are encouraged to get someone else in the household to change cat litter. <clears throat> Instant, infants born to toxoplasmosis can have many symptoms, including retinal damage, seizure disorders, developmental delays, hearing loss, and hydrocephalus. It seems likely that given that the family lives on Long Island and that the young mother was eating a considerable amount of raw or rare meat and spending time on a farm, the toxoplasmosis is the culprit. One thing I noticed in my research is that pregnant women are most likely to infect their babies with toxoplasmosis if this is their first infection. In this case, given that the young woman didn't and didn't tend to eat much meat before indulging in her husband's culinary habits, it seems that this easily could have been her first infection. Why is the first infection in the mother so much more likely to spread to the fetus than a subsequent one? We'll get back to that. If what my diagnosis is correct, what did Dr. Griffin recommend for the baby and for the mother? How was her mood with regards to her husband and his cooking after this? Did she perhaps decide to blame her farm visits for the infection instead? As always, I am so grateful and many, many best wishes to all of you. Elsie of Lower Manhattan. Jody writes, greetings, tamers of intestinal terrorists in Whiplicate. Hi, from sunny Seattle, where civic order has not yet broken down despite our fair city having just yesterday received the prestigious designation of anarchist jurisdiction from the Trump administration. The microbreweries and tech offices are all still standing. The streets are full of runners and dog walkers and stroller pushers complying with mass requirements. And the free PCR testing sites are all still humming along and providing test results in under 36 hours. Uh, just picturing this in, in my mind, the 72 F with clear blue skies. And we can leave our homes once again, now that the hazardous air caused by our state's devastating wildfires has finally cleared out. You mentioned on TWIP 187 that you have had a full mailbag right now. So I will keep it short. Well, short for me anyway. In my brief research into the case of the affluent North Shore Long Island mom whose infant was diagnosed with hydrocephalus, PD7 served up two eukaryotic parasites that can cause hydrocephalus after oral ingestion of pseudocysts or embryonated eggs in raw or undercooked meat. Toxoplasma gondii and tinea solium. However, only one of these appears to cause congenital hydrocephalus via vertical transmission from mother to child during pregnancy. Toxoplasma gondii is best known around the U.S. as the excuse <laughs> pregnant women use to avoid cleaning the litter box throughout their pregnancy. Guilty. Or more recently in pop science articles as the organism that causes an infection that can lead to reckless driving and sexual promiscuity. But it is a parasite that can infect most warm-blooded animals, including mammals and birds around the world. As Dixon has said many times, it is one of the most successful parasites on Earth. Congenital toxoplasmosis usually occurs when a woman becomes infected for the first time in her life while pregnant. And the most severe damage to the fetus seems to occur early in the pregnancy. Based on Daniel's report of our patient adopting the new husband's pension for raw animal flesh, as well as Dixon's chuckles immediately after hearing about this new habit and his subsequent pass on asking questions about the case, I'm guessing that she rejected standard recommendations of no-go foods for pregnant women and indulged in a little taboo tartare. Hoping for a book. Stay safe and thanks for keeping me company and making me squirm for the last six years, but most especially during the pandemic. 
Hi, Mom. <laughs> Jody. Hmm. Are you next, Dixon? I forgot. I, I could go if you'd like. I think you. Don't you go after me? Okay. Like I, do, I think you. Me, I, okay. And then you, Vincent. Okay. That's right. All right. It's Anna writes. Anna, Anna writes 22. Hello, Twip. I've been bringing on the episodes while I've been bing, binging on the episodes while I'm alone looking for squirrel parasites in the back roads of southern Utah where the weather is a dry upper 70s. Thought I would send a quick guess on 187 T. Gondi. I'm sure the pregnant housewife would have ample opportunity to ingest the parasite, either through undercooked meat at her hubby's parties, crunching on unwashed veggies, or encountering a cat latrine on her brother's farm. Free-ranging cats and their contamination of farms with Tiganda is an interesting topic. See this paper by Simon et al. last year. Can't wait to hear more, Anna. Uh, Owen writes, Dear Trip, Dear Twip Trio, my guest this week is congenital acquisition of toxoplasmosis for this child. The mother didn't eat much uncooked meat and has no pets, so may have avoided being exposed previously, but was probably exposed when she started eating meat that was cooked rare when her husband started serving it. Hydrocephalus is a feature of congenital toxo, so I think it fits. I've started listening to your sister podcast, TWIV, from the beginning, as well as the COVID episodes, and I am struck by how much the early episodes from 2009 come full circle to the most recent ones. The 2009 pandemic episodes, you have you were discussing pandemic preparedness, masks, antiviral agents, <laughs> conspiracy theories and all. Sometimes it's hard to remember which pandemic you're discussing. <laughs> I bring this up because in early episodes, you discuss arboviruses, which I count on. Which, which I count as a TWIP subject, given they involve ectoparasites, tenuous, I know. Uh, I looked up getting a copy of West Nile story, Dixon's book that he mentioned earlier on TWIV. Have you guys seen how much it's selling on Amazon for? How do you think I make my... Li- no, that's not true. <laughs> a, new, a new paperback. Are you joking me? A new paperback copy is selling for $985? I don't get any of that, by the way. There's no royalties that come to me whatsoever. If you have any spare crates of it laying around, Dixon, you could make a tidy sum. I find myself waiting for each episode of TWIP the week it comes out. Keep doing what you do to slake our thirst for parasitic knowledge. Oh, and, and you know, this is interesting. I'm, I'm gonna have Did to you click on this. the link? Is it really $985 <laughs> for your book? Yeah, I've seen, yeah, you know what I've seen? Funny. Really good. So <laughs> it's, it's funny because, uh, <laughs> oh my gosh, it, it's really aged well. They have, in fact, uh, I, I couldn't have written it without Vincent because in the old days, I knew nothing about viruses. And I, I went to Vincent with uh, the request that he serve as my science advisor. And he graciously did so. And I think that's actually what makes the book sing because at least facts are correct. They have the, so funny, they the have the hardcover for $25. I didn't know there was a hardcover. Uh, yeah, it did come out as hardcover. So first. that's only that's twenty five. To get it reviewed. If you don't put your books out in hardcover to begin with, the reviewers don't review them. They don't review soft cover books. Uh, so the hardcover I, I, is only twenty five bucks. The paperback is nine eighty five. But I tell you, yeah. Dixon, um, it got good reviews here. Actually, there are nine eighty five is the high choice, uh, the high price. There are other ones going <laughs> for thirty dollars. So you can get it for thirty bucks. Yeah. I, I guess I should sell my copy, right, Dixon? Well, you know, if you wanted to make a f- small fortune, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be highly insulted if you do know I want to. All right. Kevin writes. Here you go. Terrible tropisms or first hit good news. Pregnancy automatically yields two patients. The most compelling part of this case for me was the devastating idea of hydrocephalus as well as the appalling proclivity of a parasite to live in our brains. My horror of hydrocephalus was, of course, due to preconceptions and lack of experience. The very word, brutally, but literally translated as waterhead, doesn't do much to mollify. I had been previously brainwashed by an early (laughs) embryology text photograph of an extreme congenital hydrocephalus case ghoulishly trans-illuminated. Fortunately, a bit of relief was obtained via a Google search thus constructed, parasitic causes of congenital hydrocephalus, which yielded the first hit stating, babies with hydrocephalus and toxo have good outcomes. Spoiler alert, not averted. Raw meat and congenital disease rubs our noses in toxoplasma. 
A related case was discussed in TWIP 162, though not involving a neonate. A differential diagnosis should, out of good habit, not be neglected. Turning aside non-infectious causes such as anatomic malformation, tumor, and cysts, there are other infections such as rubella, CMV, lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus, syphilis, and Zika. It would be fanciful to consider intraventricular neurocysticercosis, though in a review from Nepal involving 229 cases, the youngest patient was 11 months of age. I couldn't find a single case report of congenital neonatal neurocysticercosis. PD7 gives a chilling account of toxoplasma with such statements as one of the most successful parasites on earth, and it can remain alive as a dormant infection for the life of the host. Cats, felidae, are the definitive hosts. Rodents, humans, birds, and a wide variety of other animals are incidental hosts. Another bright spot, in addition to the good outcomes news cited above, the majority of congenital toxoplasma infections are asymptomatic. The vis-a-vis transmission, avoid cat feces and raw and undercooked flesh. What causes the hydrocephalus? A review by Hudson involving 210 patients showed that CSF flow was blocked in various intraventricular locations, though no obstruction could be demonstrated in 21% of cases. Ventriculitis and subsequent obstruction of CSF flow is postulated as the cause of the fluid accumulation. Speaking of parasites and the Perperium, a reference that I stumbled across, stated that Ascaris infected women were actually more fecund than non infected. Hookworm infection, however, was associated with decreased fecundity. Go figure. As intimated earlier, treatment of the neonate with sulfadiazine and pyrimethamine and ventriculoperitoneal shunt, if needed, has been shown to improve motor and cognitive outcomes. One last thing. The privileged home of toxoplasma in the brain uh, gives it an opportunity to be something of a puppet master. And the literature of the parasite's effects on host behavior is the subject of a large number of papers. Could an asymptomatic chronic cerebral toxoplasma infection direct the host, who may simultaneously be the host of a barbecue, to serve undercooked infected meat to his guests? Tis food for thought, bad thoughts. I end with an adage, one quoted by Erasmus in Is Adagia, Percussus Resurgio. Struck down, I rise again. Thanks and strength to the three. And then we've got a bunch of end notes here. And shall I go to what? Terminal curiosity? Sure. PD7 schooled me up on the origins of the genus species name of our parasite. Do you want to pronounce that, Dixon? I'm going to give you a chance to redeem your pronunciation skills. You're muted, though. You're going to have to unmute to, to do this. Tenodactylus gundi. The common gundi, native to North Africa. The animal that Nicole first found the organism named Toxoplasma gundi. Maybe a bit cute, the gundi, not the toxo. Intimations of coming curiosities. A recent... New York Times story about scientists testing their homemade SARS-CoV-2 brews on themselves reminded me that I want to outline some of the bold self-experiments performed by parasitologists, as well as the inadvertent infections, many fatal, suffered by early investigators. It will not be titled, Curiosity Killed the Parasitologist. <laughs> I will begin with the great, but possibly apocryphal, Hunterian experiment. Stay tuned, Dr. De Pommier's ruminations will be appreciated. Hmm. Wow. Ruminations, Dixon. <laughs> I'll give it my best, but I have to eat first. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Bad pun. I think we have one more. This is the we number. Do. Yeah, yeah, the Parasitology yours. Club from uh, Central Lancaster. This is number 24. We've it. had 24 guesses. Dear Twit Professors. Hello from the Parasitology Club. The Parasitology Club believes that Tigandi, which causes toxoplasmosis and more specifically congenital toxo, is the cause of the baby's enlarged head. Toxoplasma is commonly found in cat feces, and the toxogonde oocytes can be transmitted 
into other intermediate hosts through ingestion of contaminated materials. The pregnant woman in this case is likely to have been infected with toxo by consuming unwashed vegetables contaminated with oocytes or undercooked meat provided by her husband of animals containing tissue cysts. Individuals with a strong immune system usually experience no or mild symptoms. However, pregnant women are more vulnerable to the infection, especially if infected a few months before conceiving or during pregnancy. Congenital infection occurs after primary infection of a pregnant woman, and according to McCauley, the severity of symptoms is inversely related to the gestational age at the time of infection. Severe clinical disease would be displayed in an infant whose mother was infected during the first trimester. If she had the infection months before the pregnancy, the immune system would have created antibodies to fight the parasite, leading to minor symptoms or immunity. We appreciate the case studies that are provided and very thankful for the podcasts. Okay. There you go. 24 guesses. That's great. Thanks, everybody. That was, that was marvelous. Absolutely marvelous. All right, Daniel. It's all yours. <laughs> uh, well, we've got to get our last two guesses here. Ah. So we're going we're gonna to start with uh, Dixon. We'll put you on the spot. You want me to ruminate? We're going to mute you when I uh, do this next case. <laughs> <laughs> you should, I'll turn the video camera off also. Yeah. How's that? No, well, I... I uh, how could I possibly go against the tide of this overwhelming unanimous decision? Um, I, I won't, of course, and my chuckles were, um, I guess, founded on the fact that I, I knew the pathologist at Columbia who described uh, one of the first hydrocephalic cases from toxoplasma, which was proven to be caused by toxoplasma. His name was Dr. Wolf, and he uh, worked in our pathology department, and he became famous for uh, making this discovery of the connection between the infection and the outcome of the infection, and predicted that it would be a very, very, very rare infection indeed that could cause such a horrible uh, pregnancy uh, outcome. And in fact, it turned out to be um, just the opposite. It's the probably one of the most common infectious diseases throughout the world, but hardly ever results in such an outcome as this. So the woman, uh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on her name because I forgot which case, uh, which uh, letter she was, wanted to know why, uh, if you've already had an infection, why would the, uh, the outcome be different? And that is because uh, maternal antibodies protect the fetus from the infection itself. And we're not entirely sure of why that is, uh, but we do know that there's, it presents a barrier at the area of the placenta, and, uh, and therefore the fetus does not become infected. And so if you look at this uh, infection in Europe, for instance, in France, you can see that uh, uh, at, at the age of, um, let's say, consent, uh, about 20 in uh, France for most women to say yes to get married, uh, they've already had um, uh, about 60% of those people have already uh, acquired toxoplasma. So the rate of congenital toxoplasmosis in France is very low, but the rate of uh, recurrent toxoplasma in the 80s due to the introduction of the HIV uh, virus caused very, very serious disease in uh, particularly males who were um, infected by uh, toxo as a young kid. And then, of course, uh, because of their sexual preferences, acquired toxoplasma uh, Gandhi. And they died of encephalitis, not from HIV, but rather from the encephalitis by reactivation of cysts in the brain because HIV in interferes with the process that the body uses to keep those cysts from becoming active again. So that's that's most of my ruminations. And uh, I, I picked Toxoplasma Gandhi. What do you think, Vincent? <laughs> well, I have a I have a much less sophisticated. <laughs> I mean, hydrocephalus, uh, husband, rare meats, yeah, uh, animals around. Uh, for me, it was coxoplasma from the start. I didn't do a differential. I should have, but no, I mean, no pun intended. But it was a brainer. <laughs> it was a oh. no-brainer. No, so um, I was going to clarify that when you say the 80s, you mean the 1980s. I was just yes, 1980s, that's envisioning right. these, you know, men in their 80s. But no, um, no, 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 no. The, the, so we'll move on to next. So, so everyone's feeling like it's toxoplasmosis. So what, what would be the things that we do to clarify the diagnosis? Um, and so, so a, a couple of things I'm going to say is, well, we'll start off with who should the, who should see the baby? <laughs> who should be the one who makes it? And so, you know, I, I've got to say, so the baby ends up going to a pediatrician, 
Um, and in the workup initially starts there. Um, and there's a couple things that happen. Um, there's a scan of the baby's brain and you actually can see the hydrocephalus. And I actually encourage people who are not driving, maybe who are going to listen to this at home, um, to, to do a Google search of um, hydrocephalus toxoplasmosis congenital. And you'll see some, some pretty striking um, images there. Um, so that, that's going to help us somewhat. There's also a blood test that we might do on mom and the baby that was done in this case. Um, I will say in the U.S., um, women who are pregnant, who see a, um, an obstetrician during their pregnancy, and that's where you go if you're pregnant, see obstetrician. Um, I'm going to encourage that. Um, you know, even if you want to do the birth at home, a doula, all the rest, um, um, I've actually worked with a lot of midwives through the years. It's nice to just at least make sure that certain things are done. In the U.S., we do encourage um, women to get a certain number of blood tests early on in pregnancy, things like syphilis, things like a toxoplasmosis screen. This way, if you're heading into pregnancy, and a lot of women in the United States are heading into pregnancy with no prior exposure to toxoplasmosis, if your antibodies are negative, um, it's going to be sort of reinforced, uh, the risk there and avoiding things like really eating raw meat is the highest risk activity. But, you know, we'll also talk about the, uh, the litter boxes. I think that that's a lower risk um, and a lower sort of source, but I think it's also important to think about that. Um, if you zero convert during pregnancy, right? If you're, you know, if you have negative and then you have an IgM come up during pregnancy um, and some OBs are doing this on sort of a scheduled, that's going to alert you because the earlier you jump in, potentially you can treat um, during pregnancy. Um, and maybe we'll talk a little bit about that. But now you make it through the pregnancy. Um, so this child has had a CAT scan showing the hydrocephalus. Um, you can do blood work in the mother and the baby. And if the baby acquires the disease late enough in the pregnancy, they may just have IgM. Um, and then that sort of helps you know that it's... Um, so that's another thing that this baby actually had. Um, another interesting, and I'm always shocked at how much pediatricians do this, but a lumbar puncture. You can actually do a lumbar puncture and you can examine the cerebral spinal fluid. You can even do a PCR on the cerebral spinal fluid. Um, but also what's important in guiding treatment, you actually are going to measure protein levels um, in the cerebral spinal fluid. Mm -hmm. um, so in this case, um, you know, the characteristic um, CAT scan was there. Um, the serology was consistent. Um, the baby actually had... Um, IgM, which does not cross the placenta. Um, and then the other thing I'll point out is the, the treatment here. And the treatment, this is when you go from the pediatrician, you actually need a pediatric ID specialist because you are going to treat this baby for a year with triple therapy, so three different agents. And the agents, um, you're going to have to actually be weighing the, the child um, weekly because the pure methamine, for instance, is going to be weight adjusted. So it's not just one dose. You keep adjusting it. Um, so it's really, it's complicated. Um, sometimes even steroids, glucocorticoids will be used because there can be inflammation triggered during treatment. Um, but I'm actually going to, um, I'm going to echo what's, I think Kevin wrote about this. Um, I've actually um, followed, um, children who were diagnosed with congenital um, toxo, treated. And then as time goes on, there's a plasticity to the brain. And yes. a, a lot of these kids can actually do quite well. So the outcomes are a lot better than you would initially think by looking at some of these scans. And um, there was actually a, uh, I think it was a three-year-old boy um, that uh, this is down in Peru. And, uh, you know, sort of follow the whole story. And by the time he was three, we actually was starting to do quite well. Yeah. So, um, you know, yeah. not to be as pessimistic as, you know, you, you might think when you, you Google and see some of these images of the, the yeah, CAT yeah. scans. Yeah, yeah. Did you notice anything uh, about calcifications uh, in the CAT scan? Yeah. So if people do this, as I recommended, um, do a search, you can actually see calcifications um, in the brain. Right. So I remember the, um, a case was presented at Baby's Hospital, and it used to be called that. It's now Women's and Children's Hospital. Um, of two cases, one was a um, Korean uh, orphan who had acquired uh, the infection as a one or two year old child. And the other was a congenital case of Toxo. The child was now 12 years old. The 12 year old child had glasses with very thick lenses. And um, 
Dr. Gold, Arnold Gold was the presenting physician. And, and he said, um, I forget the, the girl's name, but he said, would you mind going up to the board and um, showing us what the quadratic equation is? Okay. And half of the audience panicked because they thought he was going to ask them too, because everybody has, of course, <laughs> forgotten what the quadratic equation was. She goes up to the board, grabs a piece of chalk and writes it right out, no problems whatsoever. He said uh, five years ago, she couldn't have done that. Ten years ago, she was barely, uh, barely uh, normal, not within the, the range of normal. Uh, she was quite a bit outside of normal. So it was, he was using it as a proof of a recovery. And, and you're absolutely right. The nervous system is an amazing thing. It can do things that we don't uh, expect to happen in this kind of a situation. So one of the uh, letters wrote in and wished for a happy ending. And perhaps this child will have more also. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so too. Um, but I, I also, I think it's important for us to, and I think some of the people that wrote in pointed this out to point out and, and hopefully our listeners will even share this with other listeners is that, you know, we think, Oh, I'm here in the United States. I'm in this sort of wealthy privileged part of the world. Um, par parasites, you know, they don't, they don't respect borders, right? They're all over no, the place. That's right. Um, so yeah. That's right. Daniel, a couple of people mentioned to shunt the tube from the brain to the oh, yeah, peritoneum. Yeah. Would that have to be done? Um, it's all, it's done on a case by case basis. So what you'll basically do is, is see, is the CSF, um, all the different cisterns, are they all connected and is there free flow? Cause the fluid is formed and then it goes all the way through and has to go through the different, um, chamber cisterns. And then if there's a blockage in one place, sometimes that has to actually be done. So. Hmm. Is that a complicated surgery? Um, you, you know, it's not as complicated as you might think. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it's basically, you're going to be, um, doing a, a burr hole. You're going to be passing a tube, you know, through the skull into one of the cisterns. And then that tube is usually tunneled down and then it actually is, is releasing that fluid into the peritoneum. So that's like basically your belly. Yeah. Um, huh. so, so it goes down your neck into the peritoneum. Is that correct? Or it goes, it doesn't go outside. Exactly. The yeah. So it stays under the skin and it travels down. And once you get to the abdominal region, then it's going to be huh. tunneled deeper into the peritoneum. Wow. And, and you would have that yeah. for the rest of your life, essentially. Um, you'd have it for um, how whatever period of time it takes until um, whatever blockage goes away. If the blockage doesn't go away, it can be long term. Um, and we often um, end up getting involved again because this is, you know, potential a source of infection, foreign right. material. So, all right. So my garden vegetables. So I'm not at risk because <laughs> I'm not pregnant. My wife is not because she's not having babies. But um, is it a risk? what kind of animal would contaminate my home vegetable? I understand a farm that could be, cats. but yeah, cats, cats could come in. Interesting. Um, yeah. Dixon and I have, have talked about this, I think in a little bit in the past, you know, in general, this is in the feces of, of the cat, Got it. but when a cat pees, um, it's sort of, I think brushes past. And so, you know, when they've done collection of cat urine, you can find the oozes. I mean, it probably is, you know, sort of that fecal urine mixing. It's really like, I don't think it comes out through the bladder. I think it, it's really coming out through the intestinal tract and then it ends yes, up. That's true. But, okay. Um, as they've seen in California, it's a huge issue with the otter population oh, yes. where all the cat urine slash feces ends up in runoff off from like heavy rains through the sewer system and yeah. then actually has really devastated the otter population. Uh, so if the cats are, you know, using wow. your garden area, potentially this could get on, um, the Understood. different things that you might want to eat. And, uh, I mean, just, just to realize that, you know, when you go out there, you know, things have been peeing on your food. Sure. Um, I just took care of a family that had a good and go, golden doodle puppy and the puppy, you know, stayed within their yard, but developed leptospirosis mm. because it was, you know, it was eating the plants in their garden area there. And, uh, they obviously had rodents and the rodents were peeing. The dog was eating wow. the, wow. the dog was, was, you know, I, I talked to the dog, it really seemed unresponsive and explained to him the importance of washing um, these things before he <laughs> ate them in the future. Goodness. Or, uh, hoping that this, you know, yeah. As, aside from cats, like to, I, uh, do other animals get infected, like rabbits they, and squirrels? They all and, get infected. No, it's yeah. it's. Oh, so any of these animals? So animal, we have rabbits. Every mammal can be infected. We have rabbits in our garden, so that could be a concern. Don't eat them raw, Vincent. Uh, <laughs> they they they're only um, they're not uh, felidy. 
so the lagomorphs, so they don't develop the oocyst in the intestinal tract that the cat does. So the when they become infected, all the yeah. cysts form in the in the tissues. So unless you eat the rabbit raw, uh, you're no. going to be okay there. I'm not going to eat the rabbit, but I'm, I'm talking about the vegetables because the rabbits go in the garden. No. But yeah, they, but the rabbits are not passing anything because they can't. They're, got it. They're not part of that life okay. cycle. Okay. I, I wanted to add something, though, Vince, that I thought you would be fascinated with. <clears throat> Um, uh, Daniel mentions the uh, sea otters uh, around Monterey Bay in particular. Mm, yeah. That's where there's a lot of farming, of course, and a lot of runoff, a lot of cats, a lot of feral cats. And so the oocysts wash off into Monterey Bay. Yeah. But ordinarily, the otters would not become infected because otters um, almost exclusively eat urchins and abalone. Mm. But urchins and abalone are human food as well. So they have been scavenged uh, through over harvesting, forcing the otters to seek out another food source. Huh. The other food source that it sought out was sea snails. Sea snails acquire the oocysts huh. and store them. Wow. And if it hadn't been for our penchant for uh, a little bit uh, of um, high end cuisine, you know, the sea urchin eggs and the abalone, uh, the otters would have been left to themselves and wow. been fine. Wow. So there's an understory there that's a, kind of a tragedy. Right, so it's basically, not going on anymore, though, because what happened also was, uh, this is a longer story for another time, but <laughs> the, no, really, the, um, the otters used to eat the sea urchins. And if, they, if the, there are too many sea urchins because the otters go away, the, the urchins eat the kelp. Mm -hmm. And the kelp forests disappear. And the whole ecology of the whole place changes radically. So the otters keep the sea urchins in check, as well as the abalone. And so by eliminating the, the otter, the top uh, sort of the keystone species of that ecosystem, uh, you end up with um, bad wow. results at every end. Fascinating. So in my yeah. garden situation, would washing the vegetables be sufficient? Absolutely. Cook yes. It. Just well, wash them, you know, because you're salad, right? You know, cucumbers. Ex well, you know, tomatoes. often just, I, just pick, wash them. I pick just a cherry wash. tomato. Well, the tomatoes are high up. I'm not sure how the cats could you're get okay. to them. You're okay. You're okay. But there. often I'll be in the garden. I pop <laughs> one into my mouth because they're so good. No, no, Vincent, you're fine. You're fine. Well, I'm, I'm fine. I'm just worried about a pregnant woman. <laughs> Yeah, but you're yeah you're not a pregnant woman, nor will you ever become one. Not, <laughs> not in this incarnation. Okay. Um, but you know, all this said, as a as a as a man who will never become a pregnant woman in this incarnation, I often like will grab a tomato or a cucumber yeah. or even like a you know an ear of corn. Like when I used to do these long runs, I would you know tell the farmer that now I'm in trouble. <laughs> I would grab an ear of grab an ear of corn as sort of a, oh, a food funny. source during a that's long funny. run. All that's right. right. The only instance that I know of which would be a problematic was if you would uh, take raspberries mm. and eat those because of cyclospora and that's yeah. you know I don't have any we have uh, raspberry bushes but they never bear fruit <laughs> no I know that not in this area they're so anemic I, I totally agree with All you right. we have uh, 24 guesses let's give away a book Wow. We're going to pick very good folks. Good, good yield this time between one and 24. Great. The number is two. Wow. Jeez. Number two. two. Number two. Who's What's number the odds two? of that? I guess one and 24. <laughs> <laughs> K. It's very good, Daniel. Very the good. winner is K. I don't know who K is, but uh, K, uh, you are the winner. Uh, send me your, your address, twip at microbe.tv. If you are out of the country, I'll need a phone. But you'll all have to wait, of course, until the time is such the three of us can get together and, and autograph these books. Yeah, that's a problem. All right, Dixon, do you have a hero? I, I neglect. I am guilty as charged. I okay. will get one for next time. I'll no get problem. two for next time. How's that? All right, no problem. And gentlemen, I make a suggestion. Let's do our new case study and end this episode, which has already gone here, here. very long. So, Daniel... What have you got for us for next time? I have a, a fresh one. Um, I hope people enjoy this. I, I found this was a very interesting um, story. So here's a gentleman in his 90s. Um, and here's the way the story goes. This gentleman has been suffering, and I think suffering is accurate, um, for months. Um, so he's uh, otherwise, um, you know, relatively 
healthy, vibrant uh, gentleman in his 90s. He has a history of hypertension, has a history of diabetes. Um, he is a, he's a rather large man. He's uh, over six foot tall. He's well over 200 pounds. And um, what has he been suffering with? A rash. He has had a full body rash for months. Um, and he's gone through several different, you know, try this allergy medicine, try this cream, um, try this, uh, this prednisone, this steroid, um, you know, the, some of the pills make the itching a little bit better. The itching is particularly bad at night. Um, when he was on the short course of prednisone, the, um, the rash got a little bit better and then it got worse. Um, at one point, one of his doctors said, you know what, um, let's try three of these ivermectin pills and see if that makes any difference. He took three pills of ivermectin, actually got a little bit better for, for a couple of weeks. And then the rash got worse again. Um, finally, his primary care doctor not a dermatologist, but a primary care doctor, um, re did a really thorough exam. You know, just this is driving everyone crazy. And he found a little abnormal area between his toes. It's sort of brown, sort of scabbed. Did a scraping. Sends this off um, to be examined in the lab. <clears throat> and when it comes back, this triggers him to do a couple things. He asks a couple more questions. He says, so, you know, it's been going on a long time. Does anyone else have this? He goes, oh my gosh, my wife. My wife is suffering with the same thing. Um, he gives this gentleman not just three pills of ivermectin, but a much larger dose of ivermectin. Repeats this two weeks later. Also, the wife is treated the same way twice. And um, both the man and his wife um, find an end to their suffering. Ivermectin, huh? Ivermectin. And I'm just going to, just a couple hints. This is not, this is not COVID-19. I was just going <laughs> to ask you. <laughs> he has no HIV AIDS, right? Uh, no, he, he, no HIV AIDS. Um, I'm, I'm sometimes shocked by the limited, like, you know, the man does not drink. He doesn't smoke. Um, he's pretty, pretty active, um, healthy guy. He's 90, 90 years old. I, the reason I get involved, um, I'll tell you, is that he ends up with a cellulitis, an infection of one of his feet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he's everything else is better, but now he Got gets it. I treat that, he's he's fine. Um, but that was how this whole sort of story came together. Um, and it's just him and his wife living together, right? Exactly. He and has um grown grown children, right? I mean, he's in his nineties, as is his wife. And do, no do they go out? Do they go anywhere? I guess this is COVID-19, so nobody's going anywhere, right? Well, apparently the wife has um, has been going out um, because um, ultimately there was some, and the, the, um, the primary care doctor, um, when he really got to the source of this, the wife started to have issues first. And this started like, so this is six months, right? It's been going on for a while. This started before COVID really hit. Um, so it started so first in the wife, kind of, huh? First in the wife. Exposure before the big COVID pandemic. And, and where would she go? Anything, any place in particular that she noticed was associated um, with the she onset? Did, she did travel. She left the home and had gone on a trip. Where? Um, she wasn't, wasn't very far away. She stayed in a hotel though, I'll say. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right, there we go. Dixon, any questions? Um, just wanted to know if you had any pets. No pets. No, no pets. pets. No pets. Okie doke. No turtles. No no pet turtles. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Oh, I, I think I'll stop chuckling and asking questions for a while because... Um, you don't want to give it away? Do you I don't, like we've I don't play poker. Do you give it enough clues? I think you've given lots of clues. Okay. Good. Yeah. All right. Well, in the interest of time, we're going to stop today here. We had so many emails, and we will resume in a month. That You can find the, the show notes at microbe.tv slash twip if you have questions or comments. Twip at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Daniel Griffins at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, parasiteswithoutborders.com. Thanks, Daniel. 
Oh, pleasure as always. Thank you, everybody. If you want to hear more of Daniel, check out his weekly COVID-19 report at TWIV. Every yes. releases every Sunday. Dixon de Pommiers cool. at trichinella.org and the living river.org. I got it right that time, Dixon. You did, you did, you did. <laughs> uh, you know what they say, <laughs> practice makes perfect. Thank you, Dixon. You got it. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Good time. Good time. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank ASM for their support of TWIP and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip is, is parasitic. parasitic. <laughs>